And this, I guess, kind of boiled up in my spirit, rose up like a, a well spring of water. I was in prayer, and I'm just praying. And, and uh, one of the things that I, I do is I, I very often use patterns for prayer, and I'll pray through the tabernacle. Many of you know what I, <clears throat> what I mean by that. If you don't, stick around, and we'll talk about it, but not today. Uh, <laughs> and then often I will use what is called the Lord's Prayer as a pattern, not repeating it word for word uh actually he had well i'll teach on that another time but i use these patterns and in both patterns there is an entire time that is given to thanksgiving and praise uh when you go before the lord the bible says to enter into his courts with praise and um you all are aware that if you just show up at home and just start dumping all of your wants and needs, and can you fix this, and can you do that, and can you, you know, whatever, That's, that makes for a pretty rough relationship, right? So maybe as we go before the Lord, before we dump out all the things that we're hoping He will fix, maybe we ought to spend a minute saying, you know, we love you, uh, we honor you, we bless you, we're so thankful for what you've already done, and how you're working, and moving, and rescuing us, maybe we spend a little time doing that, then, then it might become time where we could say, and I have some needs I'd like to talk to you about, and so I was in that phase of prayer, and I do that without fail, I always pray into, Brother Jason and I were talking about this phrase that gets sort of uh, sprinkled around about praying through, and um, what, you know, what do people mean by that? And it could mean a lot of things, but I think one of the things that's very important is that we don't just, you know, pop out a, a, a pattern or, you know, a, a, a rehearsed prayer, but that we pray until we leave one realm and pray into another realm. Is that making sense? And so uh, I think a big part of that praise is that, well, I, maybe I've already gone too far into that story, but that it just started boiling inside of me. I'm praying, and if you've ever had that happen, and I'll tell you for those who, who maybe are, don't, are not as familiar with, with the ministry of prayer, I will tell you that there's a lot of times when you pray, and it's like sitting out in a waiting room, and you don't ever get in. You just pray, and when you get done, you're done. But there are a lot of times also where you pray and the veil pulls back and you enter and you enter in. And um, it just overwhelmed me when we stop and think what the Lord has rescued us from in pagan mythology and darkness and the lewd and filthy religion that has been masked and, and made to look as though it is biblical Christianity. And I just became overwhelmed with the mercy of God to pull us out and let us let us see it. And, and I was swept away by it. The Bible says it like this. He has brought us out of darkness and into a marvelous light. Hallelujah. I was living for God. Maybe you were too. I was living for God as hard as I knew how. I was. I didn't know any of the things I'm going to talk to you about today. I was living for God as hard as I knew how. And it was just so much darkness, and I couldn't rescue myself because I didn't know it. I didn't know it. You don't know what you don't know. Amen. So when I teach on these things, and I will, I'll share this with you, when I teach on these things, I've got no axe to grind, no fingers to point. I'm not trying to make anybody look silly or anybody's denomination uh, or whatever church they go to, I'm, I, I'm not. I'm not hammering away at that, but I, I am hammering away at a darkness. I am hammering away at a darkness. I'm not mad at any single person on this earth, but I am furious at a dark spirit that has duped and clouded and blinded the minds of worshipers of the one true God. So much so that if you discover it, they expect you, that spirit expects you to keep your peace, stay silent, and don't make any claims about it. And uh, that's not in my nature. That's not in my nature. So we're going to dive into it today. Let me look at my watch. That'll make y'all feel better. All right. And uh, <laughs> that doesn't help much. All right. Hallelujah. Get you a little snack, some crackers, and whatever you need. 
No, I, a lot of the material today you guys are very familiar with. I will quickly go through those. I won't spend as much time on that, but I need a little bit of background to get us ready for uh, the, the larger part of the lesson. Thank you. Sister Regina said I could go ahead, so y'all take that up with her. We started talking last week about this pagan story that's told through the spring festivals of Babylon. If you don't know, you'll see in a moment, Babylon is a worldwide multicultural religion that has expression in almost every nation, everywhere there are people. You'll see that today. Uh, it has some expression of its ancient roots. It is the fountainhead from which all false religion flows. There are not 10 false religions. There are not 20 false religions. There is one false religion and one true religion. And that's just, uh, you'll see that I believe as we go through this. So take us, Brother uh, Stephen, on to the next slide. Uh, the rise of Babylon, uh, we talked a lot about last week, so I'll just hit highlights real quickly. The rise of Babylon is a man-made kingdom that opposes the kingdom of God. It was uh, started, began to manifest under a man by the name of Nimrod, and Nimrod literally means let us rebel. That's, that's his name. I get asked from time to time, where do you get the information uh, that you teach from? And I wish I could say there's a book you could go read or a source or whatever. It's years and years of, of compiling information. I don't have a, a source outside of the Bible and the historical record. I don't, I don't, I'll say this for those who may be curious. I don't go and, and uh, take the material of other teachers and then reprocess it and pull it through this pulpit. There are guys out there that do a fantastic job, and I could call their names. Uh, I will call uh, the one that comes to mind. I've seen some of his videos, uh, a man by the name of Jim Staley. Perhaps some of you have seen some of his videos in, uh, on Christmas and things like that. Good stuff, good stuff. But I was already teaching this when he was still in Sunday school. So I didn't get it. <laughs> I didn't get it there. I, you know, sometimes people come through and they say, oh, you know, and I've said this before and I'll say it again. They come through our little congregation and say, oh, how cute. You know, they keep the Sabbath and, you know, maybe one day they'll mature and come fully into Torah. And we've been at this so long. We say, oh, how cute. <laughs> they think they keep Torah. <laughs> we've been around a long time. Uh, so anyway, uh, I just want you to know I'm not I'm not regurgitating material from somewhere else. Nimrod, historically, you can look this up. It means let us rebel. It is the first time in your Bible the word kingdom is mentioned. Uh, the law of first mention, if you'll go to some place where something is first mentioned, uh, you'll usually learn something about it. I won't go deep into that right now. But this is the first kingdom of man that uh, your Bible records in opposition to the kingdom of God. It is built around a tower. This is Genesis chapter 11. They were building a tower. I could do an entire lesson just on that tower. I will not do that today. Everybody said amen. Hallelujah. And it developed into a one world, one language, one belief, unified movement, a one world system. If you are interested in end time prophecy, revelation, Daniel, these types of things, you're going to hear things like one world government one world religion, uh, uh, one world monetary system. The modern end time teacher believes that these future events are going to just sort of develop and crop up and there's going to, Brother Clifton, there's going to be a one world religion. What they don't know is it, this has already happened and humanity in conjunction with uh, darkness is doing their dead level best to bring it back. It already existed. There is a one world religion, not just a coming one world religion. There is a one world religion, has been since Babylon. And God confounded the language, making it difficult for them to find unity in that religion. So you're going to see it manifest as a thousand different denominations, all of them worshiping on the same days. They're not my church. It is, is what it is. I, 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 you know, I want to say it as kindly as I know how, but the bottom line is this. If, you're, if where you go operates around this system, it did not, or, it did not originate in God. Well, I know God's presence is there. I got news for you. God's presence is 
everywhere. Right. Oh, I felt the spirit of God. I got chill bumps. David said, if I make my bed in hell, he's there. You can get chill bumps in hell. All right. So there's a one, there's a, there is a false system. The Bible does not say, it does not say, stay in that false system and see how many people you can influence. I hear that often. But the Bible emphatically says, come out of her. Come out. It's come out. All right. So enough there. That's, that's the preacher in me. I had to tell you that. Uh, I'm going to switch back to teacher mode so y'all will like me better. In Genesis, the Bible tells us Babylon is risen. And in Revelation, Babylon is fallen. It does not matter how we dress this system up, how religious we make it, how passionate we get about it, or how much we justify it. It rose in Genesis. It will be crushed to powder. In Revelation. As a matter of fact, the reason God says, come out, he says, come out, my people, or you will be partakers of the judgment. So uh, that leaves it to each and every one. We all have free will and we can do with that what we want. Y'all can see just from that material right there, we could have just preached all of that today and whoo. But we're not. All right, let's outline, jot it down. Next slide. So this system is a sun-worshiping religion. I'm just going to give you bits and pieces. Most of you are already familiar with all the details that connect it together. But this uh, sun-worshiping system of Babylon marks the highest days on a solar calendar. On a solar calendar. All right. So you're going to go ahead and bring up the uh, uh, clickers through here. So when you look at the pagan solar calendar, it is the circle um, of the year. Uh, Y'all, I'm going to quit saying you've heard this before, but you've heard it before, right? But I'm going to quit saying it because maybe some haven't. I'm going to give you a few clues and a few characteristics about this. For one, in the winter, many of our churches here in town and perhaps all over, or no, certainly all over, celebrate and they will drop interchangeably uh, Christmas and all these other names, but it'll also, they'll say Yuletide, Yuletide. We even, there's a song that says Yuletide carols being sung by a choir. Y'all familiar with it? Yule is the old English word for this pagan calendar. Wheel, wheel is where we get our uh, in modern English word of Yule is the wheel. The wheel of the year. This calendar is a circle. You, know, you, you see it. So this calendar, if you'll take and click one more uh, click there, Brother Stephen, you'll see that the year can be divided between the winter solstice and the summer solstice. And for those of you said you said all that last week, I didn't say it as fast as I'm saying it right now. That's it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, but it is divided between the two solstices, which are major days in pagan celebration. And it is also divided the other way between the two equinoxes. If you'll click one more, you'll see those equinoxes. And uh, this is the spring equinox and the fall equinox. And as I often say, that comes from the Latin for equal nights. This is the longest night of the year. So you have the most darkness and the least light. And that's the birthday of the sun god, the darkest night is the birthday of the sun god in the pagan story. Then you have the equal nights, and then you have the shortest night in the summer. Everybody tracking? Y'all tracking with me? Good. I, I, I'm trying not to wear y'all out before I get where I'm going. So you, you know the, uh, there's a great celebration of the impregnation of the sun goddess. Now, that get me on from here. Uh, you'll see there are three trimesters from the impregnation in the spring and I'm going to slow down and make this make a little bit of sense. And that is sometimes they present, they being every form of religion. I'm not pointing fingers at anyone in particular. They present these festivals as completely arbitrary. They just accidentally came up with uh, a Christmas and an Easter celebration. And you'll hear them say things like, well, we don't know for sure when Jesus was born. And so we just picked December the 25th. My friends, if they will lie to you about that, they will lie to you about other things. That is not what happened, not even close. This date was picked because it had long been celebrated. Who in here, I know all my young people, got a smartphone and Google, right? 
You do realize you can Google who was born on December the 25th, right? You don't have to take my word for it. I don't know how churches get away with lying anymore. Everybody sitting in the auditorium has a, has a smartphone and they can Google it. If you Google who's born on December 25th, you're going to get a list of pagan gods as long as you're armed. Dionysus, um, I hate to give you that, <laughs> Bacchus, Dionysus, uh, um, uh, what, what, what is it? Hercules, one of the one of the Hindu trinity. I mean, it's it's just long and illustrious of gods that are born at that time. Brothers and sisters, these are not different gods. These are the same God being called a different name in a different culture and religion. How do I know that? What caused Babylon to be confused? The language. That's all that has changed is the language of it. All right, uh, carry us on here because I've got some other stuff that we got to get to. And y'all know how I like this stuff so I can camp out here a while. Uh, <laughs> all right, brother Stephen, get me on off of this slide. Whatever, whatever. There we go. So this goes back to that man Nimrod. This is a relief off of the side of a Babylonian temple. It depicts Nimrod. Say, no, I think that depicts, um, oh, I'll think of his name in a minute. Um, Gilgamesh, thank you. Gilgamesh, again, the name changes depending on who's telling the story. But it is the same story. You with me? Same story. So you have Nimrod, Gilgamesh, and whoever, whatever names he goes by. The pagan story declares that he had this device by which he could predict the solstices and the equinoxes. So that's what this device did. How it did it, I don't know. I'll tell you quickly. Is this all right? I know I'm talking fast. Do y'all need me to slow down? Y'all with me? Um, I will tell you that the this device was used to make him appear to be a deity. So that he could predict the movement of the sun and therefore dupe the people that he somehow had power to control that. Because he could say when the night would shorten or when the day would lengthen or when it would be, you know, he knew ahead of time. The pagan story says that his mother uh, discovered an angel bound in a cave in chains. Now, pagan stories are not scripture. I have no idea what happened. This is just what the pagan story declares and that the uh, the angel convinced her fallen angel, I should add, convinced her that if if uh, uh, that he would give her this knowledge if she would help him raise a family. And so supposedly that's where this device came from. This device is is uh, we've made a little bit bigger picture of it here. And you may recognize something that appears in nearly every culture. And it is called the all-seeing eye. Are y'all familiar with it? It's on the back of your $1 bill at the top of a pyramid. The all-seeing eye. So this is something that goes ancient into all religions. And the all-seeing eye is the sun. The sun is the all-seeing eye. Or the sun god. The sun god. Everybody with me? We okay? No, nobody's um, all right. So far, so good. I'll keep going. So from this, and I could say much more about that, for example, to substantiate the myth, the Bible tells us in the book of Genesis that if humans mix with angels, and whether you believe that's what happened or not, I'm just telling you the mythology behind it. When angels and humans mix, they produce offspring that are considerably larger than everyone else. And that's what you see on that, whether or not that's mythology or reality, I'll leave that to you. But that is how he is depicted. You get it? So now we have this device, the all-seeing eye, and you can see easily that that is just simply the old marker of the winter solstice, the summer solstice, the spring and fall equinox. It developed in Babylon to the zodiac. It stuns me, puzzles me, how many Christians I see on Facebook posting their zodiac signs and what their horoscope. Uh, is supposed to be telling them and the origin of the word horoscope and it may have multiple origins but very likely comes from the uh, the Egyptian god Horus 
Uh, all right. So in the Babylonian year, there were 360 worshipped deities, and they were worshipped one every day of the year. I will say this, and you can put the pieces together. On the Roman Catholic calendar, every day of the year is dedicated to Saint Somebody. So there's a worship day for smaller deities in the Babylonian calendar and then major deities on major solar days. It is the same in Roman Catholicism. Unfortunately, there are Christians that celebrate these days not knowing that. Non-Catholic Christians celebrate St. Valentine's Day or St. Someone Else's Day. And that's the origin of this is finding these. All right. Having said all of that, y'all follow with me. This ancient symbol the all-seeing eye. You see the marks of the solstice and the equinox. Here it is in the zodiac. Of course, the circle in the middle is the sun, the all-seeing eye. And if I carve that out, clip it right there, right there, right there, and right there, boom, I have the exact same emblem as the emblem of Christianity. Wow. It's all, it's all conspiracy theory. Fine with me. I, you know, it is what it is. I'm just showing you what the what the elements look like. So we literally have this. I don't know if I have this in this series, but if I don't, we'll look at it another time. I don't think I do. But if you take an aerial view of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, the courtyard out front is this, is this emblem all the way back. It's the exact same. And there's an obelisk that stands exactly in the middle, a uh, solar uh, Egyptian. I think it's the obelisk of, I can't remember right now. Uh, Helios, I believe. Okay. All right. Everybody with me? Yes. When do we get to the good part? <laughs> All right, brother Stephen, take us off. <clears throat> so this ancient religion manifests itself all over the world here's what genesis said here's how god dealt with it under nimrod it said so yahweh scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of what all the earth so it's everywhere and they left off to build the city therefore the name of it is called babel which is where we get babylon all right babel because yahweh the lord did there confound the languages the languages were confounded of all the earth I'll run you a little sideline tangent. I don't know. I wasn't there, Abby. I was not that old. Uh, <laughs> but it is very likely that God also put our genetic markers in us so that our ethnicities looked different and helped us to find groups that spoke a similar language structure. And we clustered together based on those ethnicities. The Bible says plainly that God made all nations of one blood. So, you know, and I, I will say this about racism. This is why I cannot be a racist, because there is only one race. Okay. Uh, Y'all, I was talking to, trying to schedule something on the phone, and the person on the other end wanted to know some information about me. And so uh, they said, you know, uh, uh, male or female. I said, male, what's your birth date? And I told them my birth date. And they got around to asking me what was my race. I did. I said, human. And uh, they said, no, no, no. We mean, are you Hispanic? Or are you African-American? Are you Caucasian? I said, oh, you don't want to know my race at all. You want to know how much pigment I have. Why didn't you ask that? Was, you know, they, they didn't find it funny at all. But anyway, <laughs> incidentally, one more thing on that. If you go to the equator, which is the part of the earth that is under the most direct sunlight, you're going to find the darkest skin. If you go north, nearly to the Arctic Circle, you're going to find the lightest skin. You will not find a line between the equator and the North Pole where it changes from black to white. You will find a gradual progression as it moves away from the equator toward the Northern Hemisphere. There is no opposing ethnicity. It is simply a gradual move as you leave the equator. All right. So y'all got all that for free. I didn't even, that's not even in the notes. You only have to pay extra for that. He confounded their languages. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Okay. So now let me pause you before we go to the next slide. Whatever original false religion happened here, 
It has remnants now in every culture worldwide. But the language of it is different. So that we are duped and think that um, give me just a second. I can think of all the gods named but this guy. Odin. We think Odin is one story and Zeus is another and they are not. We think Zeus is a story and um, Osiris is another. They are not. They are the same God and the same story. They are just told in different languages. Now, in case you're just listening to me rattle on, wake your brain up right quick. When your kids go to college, somebody's going to tell them that Christianity is that same story. Some atheist. Muslim, somebody's going to tell them Christianity is just that same old ancient story told about Jesus instead of Dionysus, told about Jesus instead of Horus, told about Jesus instead of Thor. If you believe the Christianity being preached over pulpits, they would be right. It is biblical Christianity where Jesus said, all who came before me are liars. So, he is different, and he does not fit. The, okay, I, I, good, gracious, alive, y'all. I got to quit. How, what, what am I, about seven, eight minutes into this? All right, next, next. Please take my watch off. Somebody come get this. All right, so watch. It scatters from this tower all across the earth. The roots of Babylon spread throughout the earth through the religious symbols. A picture is worth thousand words and a symbol is worth a thousand pictures idols of the mother and son which incidentally the mother is the celebrated in the spring at the impregnation and the son celebrated at the winter solstice nine months later or three trimesters later at his birthday in the end of december idols of the mother and son are found in virtually every culture on every inhabited continent no one can sit this one out it just is what it is here are the idols going all the way back to egypt and through every culture imaginable all the way through mother and son mother and son mother and son until we get to the one that you'll find in so-called christianity it is no different it is the same thing it is the same thing it has scattered this story does not tell a biblical story of messiah our Savior has nothing to do with this. All right, next, next slide. So here they are. Maybe you've all seen this already. Uh, same gods, only the names have changed. Sun God is the ruler of heaven. The moon goddess is the queen of heaven. And then this little guy that all the Christians stuck on their walls this month is their son, uh, known as Tammuz. In the Bible, the guy on the left is called Baal. It is Nimrod. Baal Nimrod. Baal means uh, master, uh, Lord, but not in the same sense as, uh, you know, Sarah called Abraham Lord, but she was reverencing her husband. This is Lord like someone who, uh, uh, a master, a taskmaster. All right, so Baal, Ashtaroth, um, and Tammuz. This is scripture. Ashtaroth gets translated in your King James Version. This is very unfortunate because many Christians don't know she exists because for some silly reason, this word gets translated groves. Groves. And when I think of groves, I think of pecan trees down here in the south. I think they're pecan trees in other places, but <laughs> here they're pecan trees. Um, so you have Baal and the groves in your King James Bible, and you don't put it together and realize this is the ancient trinity the ancient trinity and incidentally the ancient catholics contended hard to have mary put into the trinity and ultimately the compromise was the holy spirit um, nevertheless there is the origin of the trinity this is a picture uh it's actually that is actually a stone uh, uh carving and someone has made a picture of it, so it's easier to see. But do you notice, anybody notice that this guy has uh, a, a few very unique things? 
about him that kind of fit into modern culture. For example, he's got some evergreen in his hand. That's a uh, holly or uh, um, what's somebody mistletoe. That's the word I'm looking for. He's got a magic reindeer. This is I don't know. You know these things tend to tend to stick around for a long, 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 long time, right? Then uh, the goddess, and I won't talk much about that. I will say this. The Bible says that Nimrod was a mighty hunter against the Lord, a hunter for souls. And you do see the bow and arrow of the hunter in his son, uh, Cupid. And there's a whole lot of pastors that have these little chubby Cupids all over their office. As if it is some kind of a godly uh, godly thing. And, and uh, if you really want to experience idolatry, I was listening to, I do this all the time, I listen to other religions debate their beliefs. And I was listening to a Muslim not long ago uh, saying that he was debating in a Christian school. And he said, I know it was a Christian school because it was full of idols. So the only place I know of in town where you can actually buy idols is a Christian bookstore. I don't think Walmart sells idols. They may, but you get a good selection of idols if you'll go to the Baptist bookstore. Doesn't have to be Baptist, incidentally. You know, it's a whole lot of other folks in there. All right, got to hurry. Y'all say that to me every now and then, hurry. All right, so you just see here the names change. Babylon, Egypt, Greece, Europe, they're, they're the same. Odin, uh, Frigga, Thor. But incidentally, this is where we get some of our names of the week. Wednesday is Odin's Day. Um, Frigga, and a lot of our young people are familiar with these because of the Marvel movies. Is it Marvel? Marvel movies? Marvel movies. See, I got y'all. Uh, I knew. I was just checking to see what y'all been up to. Friday, Thursday, Thursday. Y'all see it. The names just change. Okay. This gets gooder. I'm sorry if I'm, if I'm wearing you out here. Take us to the next slide. So there are remnants of this ancient religion, and if you learn to detect them, you'll see them. They'll never be able to hide from you again. Here's what you're going to find of the ancient religion of Babylon. You're always going to find a tower at the temple, the Tower of Babel. You're going to find a tower at the place of worship. You're also going to find objects of worship typically depicted on the walls. We're going to look at a verse of scripture here in a minute. You're going to find priests with censers and smoke. There's going to be some ceremony to the weeping and fasting for the sun god. Oh my goodness, this sounds like crazy stuff. Yeah, it does, but it's it's all in modern Christianity. You'll be shocked to see it. You're going to see a sunrise service at the spring equinox, and you're going to see special baked goods and celebration that are offered to the queen of heaven. Watch for these. We're going to go through this. Take us to the next slide, Brother uh, Stephen. And we'll take, we're going to go to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 8. The entire ancient religion is depicted here as Israel has backslid. And when Israel backslid, they always went to worshiping Baal. So here's what it says. Then said he unto me. This is the angel of the Lord speaking to the prophet. Son of man, lift up your eyes now the way toward the north. So I lifted up my eyes the way toward the north. And behold, northward at the gate of the altar. Now this is God's temple. God's the holy God of Israel. At his temple, he said, at the gate of the altar was this image of jealousy in the entrance. Now, I spent a lot of time trying to dig out with my limited archaeological skills the origin of this phrase, image of jealousy. It is typically depicted a, as an obelisk or a pole. Uh, when you, and you'll see some other depictions of it as we go. It is, it is, and let me go ahead and give a disclaimer. Is that all right? At, now that I'm this far into it <laughs> the pagan story my friends is not easy to tell in pg-13 language right. now i'm a pastor and i'm not going to shock y'all i'm going to do my best to talk around certain things and let y'all explain that on your way home <laughs> <laughs> but the tower the image the obelisk 
are all masculine in their representation. Y'all can translate that. The image of jealousy in the pagan system is a masculine image that stands over the people as they walk into the worship service. As you come in to worship, this is what was happening at God's temple. If you go to the Basilica of St. Peter in Rome, you cannot go into the Basilica until you walk past the enormous obelisk of Helios, which is just another image of jealousy. This is an ancient religion. This image of jealousy, they placed in front of the worship uh, place. He said, furthermore unto me, son of man, seest thou what they do here? God speaking, the angel uh, speaking. See what they do here, even the great abominations that the house of Israel committed here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary. God says, I won't go in there. I don't want anything to do with that. They, they've done this, and it causes me to want to go far off from my sanctuary. Turn again, and you are going to see greater abominations. Now, this doesn't mean better. <laughs> It means it gets worse. The, the abominations get worse. Now, we talked about abominations. I think it was last week that it makes God nauseous. Right? It, it causes him to want to vomit when he sees this worship structure. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if the church you go to has an image of jealousy over it, it makes God sick. It makes God sick. Next uh, slide. The image of jealousy started out in ancient Babylon, but the religion moved, and there it is in Egypt, and there it is in Rome, and here it is today. It is hard to find a worship, place of worship, that you're not obligated to walk under the image of jealousy to go in and worship. Now, if you want to know the the nitty-gritty, dirty details, I can't give them in that fashion, but I will say this. The ideology behind this is that the sun shines on the image of jealousy and casts a shadow over the worshipers. And that is supposed to depict an impregnation that the, that the sun is casting by, via its shadow onto the worshipers. All right. And... I would rather sit here in this little battleship gray cinder block spot <laughs> than to hold hands singing Kumbaya on the way in under one of these. Just is what it is. All right. I said, brother, you're just making a mountain out of a molehill. Maybe so, but I'm going to tell you this. When the Lord comes back and the kingdom is established, I double dog dare you to put an image of jealousy anywhere he's to be worshipped. Amen. All right, next slide. Good. Gracious alive. I only have an hour left. If you continue on in, in Ezekiel, I'm just picking up at the next verse. Everybody got a snack? Y'all got everything you need? If your sugar gets to dropping on you? He said unto me, go in and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. What did he call them? Wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and saw and behold all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the walls round about. Now, he said wicked abominations. We say beautiful church decorations. So take us to the next slide. The religion that is common and considered godly still follows the same ancient pattern. I had a friend of mine years ago, and uh, he had a lot of tattoos, and he said, uh, he said, you don't like my tattoos. I said, well, you know, it's not, I, I, don't, I, just, I don't think that's really what God wants, but, it, you know, it's your body, whatever. And he said, well, here's the deal. He said, I, I think the Bible said that your body was a temple, and you never seen a temple that wasn't decorated. <laughs> I said, well, not a pagan one anyway. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. That's that. There it is. I will, hold on, hold on. I will tell you, I went to the Greek Orthodox uh, church downtown. And they have a wonderful festival every year. They call it Greek Fest. And I love the food. And it's hard to, I walk around the uh, obelisk to get back there. And, and anyway, 
the guy was explaining that, I don't know if he's a priest or what, but he was explaining that in the Greek Orthodox Church, you're always going to find an enormous depiction of Mary and baby Jesus. And um, how many of you remember in the book of Acts, when Paul went through this region of the world preaching, they got angry with him and they threw dirt in the air, the Bible said, for a space of two hours. They threw dirt into the air and shouted him down and said, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Different name, the same idol. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. In the Eastern Orthodox Church, you're going to find them still honoring Diana of the Ephesians. And I said to the guy that was doing the tour, I said, looks like Paul and Diana made up. <laughs> He didn't answer any more questions I had after that. All right, now we can take, go to the next uh, go to the next slide. Is this okay? I as if y'all would say no. Sit down and hush. <clears throat> uh, all right, this priesthood censors spoke Ezekiel chapter eight, same same chapter, just next verse. There stood before them seventy men of the ancients of the house of Israel, and in the midst of them stood Jay, uh, Jaazaniah, the son of, of Shaphan. And every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. And if you'll take us to the next slide, you'll see this ancient pagan religion depicted in modern Christianity. There it is, the 70 old men with their censers and their smoke. It is the same, the same religion. All right, moving on to the next slide. And here's where I'm going to focus today. Everybody see just now getting to the focus? Yeah, yeah, we had just now getting there. So the very next verse, 13, said that he said unto me, turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. Now, I got to level with you. We started out with the image of jealousy, and in my mind, I know what that really is. I can't imagine it getting much more wicked than that. But God says each level of this is more disgusting to him than the level before it. This, my friends, is why in this little congregation, and I get it, I hope someday that half of the city, if not all of the city, would come here and learn these things. But it's God's business. But I will tell you, it's why we are passionate and we're adamant about sticking with the truth of the Word of God. The Bible says that if we will keep God's commandments, it will keep us from that wicked woman, that strange woman in Proverbs chapter 7. That strange woman, my friends, is a religion. And that religion will draw you into it and make you compromise with it. It will say, look, I don't really like to go to their Easter egg hunt, but this is still my church. God said the whole thing of it is disgusting to me. And if you'll keep the commandments, you'll be in church on Sabbath, the seventh day, and you won't be worshiping idols and you won't be honoring other gods. And if we have, if we, that's all y'all talk about. That's all y'all talk about, man. Every time I've had friends of mine say, you don't ever talk about Jesus. I'm like, are you kidding? <laughs> We're talking about his kingdom. I mean, are you? You got to be nuts. Anyway, they said, you know, you just want to talk about the Sabbath, and you just want to talk about idolatry. I'm like, have you ever read the Ten Commandments? If we'll talk about don't have any other gods, don't make or bow down to anything idolatrous, God's seventh days of Sabbath, it'll keep you out of those Sunday, Christmas, Easter churches. You'll get disgusted when you walk in. You won't get chill bumps and weepy eyed. You'll be like, this is disgusting. So he said, turn to yet again, you'll see even greater abominations. He brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Tammuz, is that right? You say it. Say, brother, you are just off of your rocker. You talk about all this stuff. I'll tell you what, find a place and sit down and watch over the next month if you don't see this ancient practice taking place right here in your city and with a whole bunch of your friends. It's going on right now. We went last night. Sister Lilia couldn't even hardly get home for having to drive through the party that they're having, not her, the party that Mobile is having in honor of Tammuz. And nobody knows it. This is just for the kids. You better believe it's for the kids. You better believe it's for the kids. God said, teach your kids when they get up, when you lay down at night and they get up in the morning, they sit at the table, teach them my commandments. If they train up a child in the way it should go, when it's old, it won't depart from it. So it is for the kids. Watch this, weeping for Tammuz. Take me to the next slide. We're about to approach a day called Ash Wednesday. 
Ash Wednesday begins an ancient festival which the Catholics and other denominations now call Lent, but it is the 40 days of fasting to bring up the spirit of Tammuz from the underworld if you read the pagan mythology. In the pagan mythology, you must you must fast, you must give up something, and you must weep, and you must pull that spirit up from the underworld so that the goddess can be impregnated by the spring equinox. I hope I haven't lost you in that. I'll point it out on a calendar here in a moment. But this weeping for Tammuz begins on Ash Wednesday, and you must suffer for 40 days plus all the Sundays. You suffer to bring up Tammuz by Easter, bring up Tammuz by spring, by spring equinox. Everybody says, no, this is religious, brother. Don't you see it? And they, all these sweet people that are going to get in Jesus's cross, put on their forehead. They are not. This has been done since ever before Jesus was ever crucified. They marked their forehead with a T for Tammuz. Right. It's still being done today. Incidentally, and many of you know this, but this, is, this ash is carbon. And carbon, the element, has six neutrons, six protons, and six electrons. It is very literally marking the forehead with 666. Now, that's going to begin. Boy, I wish I had another hour. Don't get nervous. I don't. But the worshiping and the bringing up of Tammuz is done by a priesthood depicted as fish. They wear a fish hat. Um, Y'all probably know where I'm going with that. A fish hat. Uh, give me a second. I'll pull up the name of the god Dagon. The priest of Dagon dressed in a fish uniform. They wear the ma open mouth of a fish as their hat. Looks exactly like the mitre that the pope and bishops wear in the church of Rome. And through Lent, guess what you can eat? Fish. And all of the fast food restaurants around here are going to have two-for-one fish sandwiches very, very soon because of, because of that, in honor to the fish god Dagon. Whew. Catch my breath. If you are sensitive... I hope you've enjoyed the service. <laughs> this has all been kindergarten stage. <clears throat> there is no way to make this polite, although I will not use very descriptive language, but all of the festivals around this time of the year in this ancient ceremony are designed to impregnate a goddess by the spring equinox so that we can have Christmas by December 25th, okay? And if you understand biology, then you know how this works. Take us to the next slide. So in this year, we've gone back to the solar year. I talked about this last week. You can see that the major symbols of this religion still match this ancient Babylonian thing. We're gonna get this goddess impregnated in the spring so that we have three trimesters for the baby to be born at the end of December okay this is Tammuz I know Christians say oh that's baby Jesus it is not he is not born in the spring and she does not conceive excuse me he's not born at the winter solstice and she does not conceive in the spring there are a cluster of festivals that happen that are all focused on the impregnation of this goddess. And I don't know any real tender, polite way, but we're just going to work through them and, and talk as delicately as we can. But all of these cluster in order to bring about this miraculous event, which is her getting pregnant. So the, last, for the first one, if you'll take me to the next slide, the first one we talked about last week, Lupercalia, the middle of February. So I won't go deep into that, but you all remember the lessons of the leather whips and the whole deal they that they did on the 14th uh, of February leading into the 15th. This was actually a bishop that preached against it. And as you know, you can go back and watch that lesson. They killed him and then named the day after him. Just disgusting to me, but that's what happened. All right, that's Valentine. He was a 
an ancient bishop. Next, Mardi Gras. Now, this doesn't happen everywhere, but I'm going to talk about it because the birthplace in North America is Mobile. Everybody thinks it's New Orleans, but it's not. It's in the guy that got it kicked off is buried downtown Mobile. Uh, his name is Joe Kane, and there's going to be a whole bunch of ladies in our city put on black wedding gowns. Have y'all ever seen it? They put on black wedding gowns. They call, they're called the, the uh, uh, widows of Joe Kane, and they go stand over his grave downtown Mobile and cry over him. And they actually have had to stop them because the graves are so old, they started caving in under the weight of, the, of these weeping widows that go down to, you'll see it, it'll be on the news. Uh, it'll happen here very, very soon. So as you all, you're probably familiar with these, the, the floats and the revelry, and, and the Bible says that Christians should not be reveling in the streets, and they literally call these revelers. But maybe you just think it's a great big party, and you say, well, we don't get involved in the, you know, the bad side of it. We don't do all of that. But I'm going to uncover the origin of it so that you can see what's going on. So there are the gods, the floats, the idols. There are the revelers and worshipers in the streets. And then there's this very odd cake and unfortunately very delicious. There's this very odd cake. Uh, why is it uh, built the way that it is? It has a little plastic, they say, baby Jesus in it. And the fact of the matter is, this goes back to an ancient thing of baking to the uh, queen of heaven. And so we'll talk a little bit about that in the next few minutes. I got about 10 minutes if I can put all this in here. So take us to the next slide, brother uh, Stephen. This I got from history.com. I didn't make it up. This is history.com says Mardi Gras is a Christian holiday. How they did their homework. Mardi Gras is a Christian holiday, a popular cultural phenomenon. Mardi Gras dates back thousands of years to pagan spring and fertility rites. How in the world it's a Christian festival? It dates back thousands of years to pagan spring and fertility rites. History.com, that's you know, it's their company. Also known as, and of course, I think in Brazil, they pronounce it carnival. Uh, you may already see this if you're a language person. We think, oh, a carnival, that's a happy time. No, it comes from the Greek word carnal, to be fleshly. It is to feed your flesh, to do everything your flesh wants to do. It is everything the Bible tells us not to be. <laughs> Don't be carnally minded. Right, and so that's this is all about being carnal. Uh, it's known as carnival. is celebrated in many countries around the uh, world, mainly those with large Roman Catholic populations. On the day before the religious season of Lent, now we talked about that being the uh, weeping for Tammuz. So, on the day before the religious uh, system of Lent. Uh, begins. Brazil, Venice, New Orleans play host to some of the holiday's most famous public festivities, drawing thousands of tourists and what? And revelers every year. Take us to the next slide. It'll finish this paragraph out. We really are uh, beginning to wrap this up. For those who, if you happen to be antsy, uh, hang in there. According to historians, Mardi Gras dates back thousands of years to pagan celebrations of fertility, including the raucous Roman festivals of Saturnalia. That's in December. How could Mardi Gras have anything to do with Saturnalia? Because it happens nine months before. It is the birth cycle. Saturnalia and Lupercalia. Now, y'all know that's Valentine's Day. All right. When Christianity, I didn't, I love this. I didn't write this. This is good stuff. It wasn't me. I, would, I wish I had wrote it. It says, when Christianity arrived in Rome, religious leaders, now they couldn't have been Christian religious leaders because Christianity arrived in Rome. Religious leaders decided to incorporate these popular local traditions into the new faith. Incidentally, the faith was not very new. People say, well, they were already doing this by, say, 250, 300 A.D. Ladies and gentlemen, that's as far as we live now from George Washington. Okay. They incorporated these popular traditions into the new faith 
an easier task than abolishing them altogether. So, brother, why is your church so small? Y'all know it's not my church, but why? because it's an easier task to incorporate paganism than it is to abolish it. Y'all get that, right? Say, well, if this was true, you know, the church across town, maybe I, they got 300 members. That's got to be where God is. Either that or it's a lot easier to pretend to be Christian and still do the Babylonian deal than it is for us to get to the, together and say, I can't do that. I'm not doing that. Okay. It's easier to incorporate than to abolish them altogether. As a result, the excess and debauchery of Mardi Gras season became a prelude to Lent, the 40 days of penance between Ash Wednesday and Easter Sunday. Mardi Gras spread from Rome to other European countries, including France, Germany, Spain, and England. Let's peel it back and see what's actually being celebrated. Take us to that next slide, brother. So Mardi Gras is French for Fat Tuesday. Now, remember we were talking a minute ago about Odin's Day being Wednesday and Thor's Day being Thursday and Frigga being Friday. So there's a little thing here. I'm one of those weird language people that you may not have noticed. And that is that in French, uh, you have Tuesday is Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras, okay? I'm going to tell you another name of a day. It'll help all this fit together. So, sun, uh, excuse me, uh, Monday in French. Does anybody know how you say Monday in French? Somebody might. What you say, bro? Lunde gras. Lunde gras. Lunde gras in French is Monday. Y'all get it? Lunar. Lunar day. Monday. So, we say Monday in English. They say Lunde gras in French because, you know, they don't know how to talk right. So all that happened is Tuesday is actually the day for the god Mars, Mar de Gras. Only we used in English instead of using the Greek, it, it's a mix between Greek and Latin. One is two and one is Mars. So we went the other route. But many languages call Tuesday with the god Mars. Incidentally, and y'all probably know this, in just gaboodles of languages. Saturday is Sabbath. I had a, I had a good friend of mine. Uh, well, anyway, I had, had a friend of mine <laughs> that speaks Portuguese arguing with me about the Sabbath I, on Facebook, making a big deal out of it. No, 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 no. Sabbath is Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. I said, tell you what, I'm going to make you a deal. I want you to post for me the word for Saturday in Portuguese. And they never answered the text ever again. It's act like it just vanished. It just went away. They never answered the text again. Why? It's Sabado. Sabado. <laughs> All right. So, Fat Tuesday is before Ash Wednesday. Why is it fat? Because <laughs> you are about to have to start weeping and fasting for Tammuz. So you got to get all the sin out of your system by Fat Tuesday. You got to do all the sinning you can stand, all the idolatry you can hold, all the adultery you can put up with, everything, all the drinking, all the carousing, all the filth, all the debauchery, because starting on Ash Wednesday, you got to start weeping for Tammuz to bring him up from the underworld. So you got to go stark, raven, lunatic, nuts. <laughs> Isn't that right, Brother Jackson? <laughs> to hear. So the beads, the beads, the beads. Oh, my goodness. So oh, well, we got to get these beads. So what are the beads? Well, in Roman Catholicism and many other languages, excuse me, religions, not languages, religions, the prayer beads you have to count them so many times based on how egregious your sin was. So the whole idea behind Mardi Gras is to have a lot of beads to demonstrate how much debauchery 
you have been involved in. The more beads you have, the worse sinner you've been. you got to count a lot of beads to overcome what you've done. And so, incidentally, those beads are earned in some very lewd ways, which I don't have a picture of up here. <laughs> so, you can see the revelry, the worship, the floats are going by with Neptune and Zeus and the, and the gods on the... And if you actually look at the names of the Mardi Gras societies, they are crew of Bacchus, crew of Zeus, these are, these are secret societies that were originally to worship these, these uh, uh, gods and the people. And here's what gets me. They think that we are supposed to worship by sitting there like bumps on pickles in a Christian church. That's worship. You worship by being very reverent. Oh, this all this stuff y'all do. That is, that's, oh, oh that's, so, that's so wrong. Really, because when y'all worship y'all's gods, y'all go nuts. Y'all scream, you shout, you, 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 you dance. You did. I'm supposed to sit here. If I, I just got to sit here and be quiet. I'm going to tell you something. When the Spirit of God comes in, I'm getting on my feet. I'm going to worship. I'm going to shout. I'm going to clap. I'm going to dance. I'm going to raise my voice. I'm going to get excited. He wants me quiet. He knows how to get me quiet. I've said it many times. He'll just knock you right out on the floor. Yeah, no problem. He said, hey, "Can I get a witness?" I'll just. He said, "Okay, now you, that was good." Ooh. You'll get up when he's done with you. Amen. So you do all of this. You earn all of your beads, and then you go in on Ash Wednesday, and you get marked with the T for Tammuz with the with the uh, carbon with the carbon. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm kind of coming in for a close here. And then you celebrate with this cake. Very unusual shaped cake. And I am struggling within my creature to figure out how to explain that. <laughs> uh, so if the image of jealousy is masculinity, then this cake is femininity. And it is shaped to to represent femininity. And in it is placed a baby. This is the goal of all of the debauchery and all of the bringing up the child from the underworld. It is to get an impregnated seed into the womb of the goddess. And worship, even in God's system, is the eating of that that you're partaking in. And so that's what this is all about. It is, and we used to just be so happy. We, oh, I got the baby. You know, he broke a tooth, but, you know, that's, those who didn't grow up around Mobile don't know anything about it, but that was a big deal to cut into that, cut into that uh, king cake, king cake, and, and be the one that got the little baby Tammuz. Of course, we thought it was Jesus. This goes way back. All right. Now we are coming to the spring. The purpose is for the goddess to get the goddess impregnated. Everybody see the pattern? See what's going on here? Take me to the next slide. So I'm not, I just, I'm just going to, y'all just got to figure this one out. <laughs> so the maypole has a series of streamers. Each streamer runs to a child. The imagery there is all about having children. I don't, I don't know how to explain it. So at the top of the maypole, which incidentally is a masculine symbol, at the top is the wreath, which incidentally is a feminine symbol. And the idea is to celebrate the spring that the goddess is now pregnant. That the goddess, that the, 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 the masculine emblem of the, of the false god has Merged with the, uh, y'all get it. All right. <laughs> they had me doing this in elementary school. Did anybody else do it? In elementary school, we got the little streamer and we danced and we wove around until, the, until all that streamer was wrapped all the way down that pole. And we just thought we were having ourselves a good old time. It was great. It was the maypole. So just what you do in the spring. You see, it all comes to the same thing. Now, take me to the next slide. 
This is called the May Queen. She is this, she is in some cultures, particularly European culture, she is the goddess. I'm going to do something kind of weird. There is a song, and for those of you who are in my age group, you remember, it was called Stairway to Heaven. Who, who did that? Was that Led Zeppelin? Stairway to Heaven. Stairway to Heaven. There's a very odd phrase in the lyrics of that song. And it says, it's a spring clean for the May Queen. I'm going to play it. You'll see it. It's just a spring clean for the May Queen. Then I'm going to run it backwards. And some people say, I don't believe in that back mass stuff. And that's okay. I'm, this is not Bible. I'm just showing you something here. But in Satan worship and Luciferian religion, you hide stuff in reverse. It's why Michael Jackson did the moonwalk. Alistair Crowley had a lot of, and I, maybe I'm dropping names that some of you don't know, but he was a, he was a, uh, he wrote a lot of witchcraft and a lot of uh, Luciferian theology, for lack of a better term. Alistair Crowley met with the Beatles and uh, Michael Jackson had a lot of influence over rock music. And he told them that Luciferian religion does things in reverse. So dance backwards, sing backwards, walk backwards, these kinds of things. And it began to show up in their music. Say, brother, I can't go. I don't believe all that. That's okay. You don't have to. You may, this may not, you may just say, well, that was, that was dumb. I don't even know why you did it. That's all right. I'm going to play a short clip of this song. You're going to see the lyrics. He's going to say, there's a spring clean for the May Queen. And then we're going to play it backwards and see if you hear it. Go ahead. Y'all ready for springtime? There is such a demonic influence in this push to celebrate these things. And do what's that? <laughs> Y'all give me a couple of more minutes, gonna have two more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> right. There is a demonic, ancient, spiritual religion that does not care if you say Jesus at church as long as you participate in these ancient rituals. You can get all the chill bumps you want. You can get misty-eyed. All of that's fine with him. No problem at all. But there is a darkness that pushes these things. Okay? And I just wanted you to see it. Take us to the next slide. Here's what all of this culminates in. Ezekiel 8, same chapter, next verse. Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man, turn to yet again? And thou shalt see greater abominations than these. Now I thought the obelisk over the church was bad. He says, it gets worse. He brought me to the inner court of the Lord's house and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their face, faces toward the east. And they worshiped the sun before the, toward the east. All of this is culminating to what 
a large portion of the churches in this city are going to do on Easter Sunday morning. They're going to go to Mardi Gras. They're going to celebrate. They're going to dance in the streets. They're going to go on Ash Wednesday. They're going to get their foreheads marked with ashes. Then they're going to begin to fast and weep for Tammuz for 40 days plus Sundays. And then at the culmination of all of that, take me to the next slide, they're going to the sunrise service on Easter Sunday morning. This is not new, and it is not Christian. It is an ancient, dark religion. And we do it, I did it, out of ignorance. But I thank God that he has made me free. The Bible said you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. It's why churches use paganism to win their converts. If you win them with paganism, you win them to paganism. Brother, it's just too hard. It's too tough. It's, too, it's just too in your face. I get it. I get it. I don't know how to do it any other way. I don't know. But I will say this. If you're in a burning house, I think I'd yell. I think I'd get loud trying to wake you up to get you out. Amen? All right. Next slide. We're going to wrap it up. Here we go. Special baked goods. You've seen them, the, the cakes. See, uh, see thou not what they do in the cities of Judah. Take me back so I can finish that verse to the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. It's all about the children, guys. It's just, it's just, we just do this for the kids, man. The kids love it to catch the moon pies and they hide there and look for the Easter eggs and they come bouncing down the stairs on Christmas morning and open the packages. The children gather the wood. The fathers kindle the fire. And the women need the dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods that they may provoke me to anger. It's true. It's just true. There is no excuse in the modern world. You can Google it. You can YouTube it. You can find it. I'm not making these things up. This is the system that we are against. I will say this, and I've said it many times before, and that is churches raise huge amounts of money to go into what they perceive as pagan cultures and send missionaries out. And the city you live in is holy. Not holy, not, not like holy God, whole, complete, holy given to idolatry. We are God's witness in a pagan land. It just is. just is what it is. It provokes him to anger. Take us to that next slide. And there you have it. We do it. The hot cross buns, the cakes, the cookies, the whole deal. It's just, it, it's all right there in your Bible. But it just, until you get a kingdom concept, until you realize there are two opposing systems, then it just seems like, well, man, that cat down there, he just thinks everything's pagan. I mean, you can't do nothing. Everything's pagan. I tell my kids sometimes, like, we want to go to Dairy Queen. And you know, I said, oh, Dairy Queen's pagan. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> but if you take these things <laughs> point by point individually, it just seems like we rant about everything. But when you see the whole system, then you understand that there is a hidden agenda going on yes the language has changed the story stays the same does that make sense let's all stand all right i want god i will please help me lord i want to be one of those preachers that preaches everybody happy <laughs> and i want y'all jumping well praise god hallelujah sister Catherine said i preached her happy <laughs> oh man I, I, I want to run in the aisles man knocking folks out We'll get to that. We'll get to that. How about we get excited about the truth, though? How about we celebrate that God has pulled the blinders, pulled it back, and let us see. Let us see the truth. I apologize. It was a very, very long lesson today. Uh, but I had to try to get to those key elements because it is happening right now in my city. Uh, it is going on right now. And our, and our churches of every stripe and denomination are participating in some way or another. So, well, no, we, we, our church is not doing Mardi Gras. There's an element on there somewhere on that list that they're fully engaged in. 
And there's a people gathering. Look around right quick. Just look left and right. There is a people gathering. So I don't know if I, I don't know if I 100% agree with that guy over there. You know what? You agree with him more than you agree with anybody else in this city. That's a fact. So I don't, I don't know if I, I don't know if y'all to wear a pink coat. <laughs> we better see, we better recognize God is doing something. Can I pray for you today? Would you lift your hands? Mighty Yahweh, we come before you in the house of the Lord. Here, Lord, on a different day, here in a different atmosphere, here in a different spirit, the spirit of holiness, the spirit of truth. We ask you, God, that you would amplify your word in us, amplify your government in us, amplify your kingdom against this pagan debauchery. Cause us, oh God, to rise up, not just in, in pointing the finger, but let us rise up as a light, as a city that is set upon a hill that cannot be hid. Let righteousness shine forth, your righteousness, through the people of your kingdom. God, I pray that you'd encourage everyone under the sound of my voice in every city represented online today, that you would encourage them, that you would empower them, that you would embolden them. God, that we would be able to stand in unity and represent the glory of the coming King in a pagan land. I pray, God, that you'd give us great harvest. Let the hearts of those who hear be moved. Let them be moved, O great King. Let them be called out of darkness and into a marvelous light. We give you the praise in the name of Yeshua, our great King. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right. So we're going to get ready and uh, invite everyone who would like. We're going to come around and, and uh, bless the Lord's table. And I'm just going to ask you to, uh, uh, if you